Hello everyone, I'm George from Ireland and here I am on Camden um, Square, Camden Hill Square in London, an area called Holland Park. And this was uh, Siegfried Sassoon's house. So he was born in 1886 in Kent, as a county just outside London to the, um, to the south uh, east. Anyway, what a fine house it is. You can tell he was rather rich. So he's born into an upper middle class family. He had an older brother and a younger brother. Um, <laughs> the Sassoons were a very wealthy merchant family um, uh, who were uh, from, from Iraq. They were Baghdadi Jews. Of course, there'd been a Jewish community in Iraq since biblical times until the 1950s. These days, Iraqi Jews are either very, very discreet or else very, very dead. Uh, but not so in the time of his grandparents. Anyway, um, so they, they, they then moved to the United Kingdom, but his um, father had married a Gentile, and for wedding a shiksa, he was cut off without a penny by his family. I'm not sure what short profession he followed, but they, they, followed, they lived in some comfort. His mother's maiden name was, was Thornycroft. Um, there was that uh, celebrated ha uh, sculptor Hamo Thornycroft, who um, was her brother, as in Siegfried Sassoon's uh, uncle, and he's responsible for some of the most famous um, sculptures um, in the United Kingdom public art. There's one right beside Westminster Bridge in the northern edge of Westminster Bridge, the one of um, Queen uh, Boadicea, or Boudicca, as we now call her. And there was Peter Thornycroft, the Chartsy Exchequer, a Tory, I think it was in the 60s, but uh, I'm not sure if there's any relation, actually. There's the only ones I've ever heard of, the Th Thornycroft. So it was Thorny Island, um, right beside Parliament in the Middle Ages. There's no longer an island. Anyway, back to Siegfried Sassoon. So he grew up um, uh, in Kent, and they went to Marlborough College, which is a public school in um, Western England. Only other famous people who ever been went there were um, William Morris and Princess Kate Middleton. Um, it was um, near the town of Marlborough. I don't think it's named in honor of the Duke of Marlborough. Uh, so um, he, w he was a fairly clever chap, not that diligent. Uh, he went on to Clare College, Cambridge. It wasn't that difficult to get into the two great English universities at that time if you had the right schooling and if you measured up financially. So he went up to read history, but uh, spent most of his time on leisure pursuits. Uh, he liked country sports, um, and he, he went down after two years without, without graduating. It wasn't that uncommon to leave, to get a little learning and say, that's enough for me. Um, so he had a bit of family money. So um, he lived fairly modestly in London, uh, very, doing very well considering he didn't have to work a stroke. And uh, he wrote some prose and poetry and paid to have it published. Then his aunt died and left him um, a generous legacy. So he, he lived in rather better circumstances. Um, he didn't care very much about politics or international affairs. But in the run-up to the First World War, he started to um, be fascinated by what was going on. And he was actuated by nationalistic motives to uh, join the British Army. He joined uh, the um, Kent Yeomanry, because that was his native county. Um, yeoman um, meaning, it used to mean a farmer who owned a horse or someone that, that social status because if you owned any sort of horse you were doing better than most people. But these were, these were part-time um, uh, soldiers, then they were coming full-time when the war was on. It was a cavalry regiment, but he, he, he fell off his steed and was uh, delayed when he was meant to be going to, to war. He met Rupert Brooke briefly, that, that poet who'd written when the First World War broke out, Thank you, O Lord, who has matched us with this hour. Um, who seemed to think that it was a glorious opportunity to prove his valour. Um, Rupert Brooke then died of an illness of um, Gallipoli without actually seeing any action, so rather inglorious end. But uh, Rupert Brooke, with it, within sort of eight months of the war starting, had begun to eat his words and rue the fact that he'd welcomed the war. Um, so, uh, so soon he was later dispatched to France, but this time with the Royal Welch Fusiliers. Uh, it is spelled C-H in the name of the, name of the, name of the regiment Welch, not Welsh. I suppose he's supposed to pronounce it Welsh, even though he wasn't Welsh at all. And there he met um, Robert Graves, one of the famous um, poets of the war, writer of the war, lived on to the 1980s. And the two formed an instant rapport. They were both um, uh, budding writers and really had, had similar backgrounds, personalities, and uh, artistic sensibility. So um, he too became very disillusioned with the war and thought that it wasn't fought uh, for righteous reasons after all. Uh, he began to find um, chauvinism very unpalatable and he liked to skewer um, the chauvinistic attitudes um, by parodying them.
And so he wrote some poetry there, and then he was ill. He was he was sent to Craig Lockhart Hospital just outside Edinburgh. It's a university building now. I can't remember which one. It's at Napier University, where he um, got to know Wilfred Owen, um, probably the most famous of the war poets. And uh, he did a lot to, to burnish Wilfred Owen's reputation to make sure that his poetry was read long after Owen died. His poetry is more widely appreciated of that than that of Rupert Brooke, um, than that of, sorry, of, of Siegfried Sassoon, because um, Wilfred Owen was killed on the 4th of, of November 1918. And as the joy bells were ringing out for victory on the 11th of November, a postman was cycling up uh, the lane towards his parents' house with a telegram breaking the news their son had been killed only a week before the end of the war. Um, anyway, so Siegfried soon uh, r r survived the war. He didn't get himself into too much trouble for his anti-war activism. 1919, he was demobilized. When the 28th of June that year, the Treaty of Versailles was signed, which finalized the war. Um, anyhow, so uh, he got into labor politics, didn't stand for, for election or anything like that, uh, and just really spent most, most of the rest of his life as a writer. Um, was he bisexual? It's debatable. He was mainly gay, it seems to me, in his 20s and 30s. Had a relationship with a number of men, including Sir Ivan Novello, the, um, uh, the uh, librettist of all those musical hall songs, best known for Keep the Home Fires Burning, Though Your Hearts Are Yearning, and things. there's a silver lining through the dark cloud shining. <clears throat> but um, then when he was uh, 36 or so, he married uh, a female of the species who was rather younger than him. I don't remember her name, actually. It took five years for them to produce a child. So finally became uh, a father at the age of about 40, one son, George, who only died in 2006. Um, so he lived in the country. I lived here in the 1920s after the end of the war. Later, he moved to Wiltshire. He lived on until 1967. Um, so he's better known, I suppose, for his prose, you know, memoirs of an instrumentary officer saying what it's like, the sheer uh, futility of it all as he saw it, uh, memoirs of a fox hunting man, which um, is a, an, an autobiography. He wrote under a number of nom de plume. I'm not quite sure why. Anyway, that is uh, Siegfried Sassoon. Toodaloo.